Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is... Richard, 3rd Duke of York, Part 3. Welcome back. This is going to be a busy episode. The year 1450 in England was an intense year, and I'm going to cover more than that. This will be the longest episode of the four Richard Duke of York episodes. I do hope it's not too much, and I actually really enjoyed learning more about this time and writing this episode. Since it's so big, let's just get into it. Outside of Ireland, things were going very poorly for the Kingdom of England in 1450. While Maine had been returned, Henry VI still claimed to be King of France, and that made it difficult for Charles VII to negotiate with him. Henry wanted peace, but couldn't give up his titles without losing face with his people. Adam Mullins, the Lord Privy Seal, had been murdered by a mob while trying to leave the country on pilgrimage. And not long after, William de la Pole, by then the Duke of Suffolk, was arrested for treason due to the marriage negotiations in France that I discussed in the last episode. While the king had forgiven him, the commons hadn't, and Suffolk was punished with banishment for five years. As we'll remember from the end of Richard II's reign, banishment can go well, theoretically, as it did in Henry Bolingbroke's case, or poorly, as it did in Richard de Mowbray's case. In Suffolk's case, it went disastrously. <laughs> In the channel, while sailing to Calais, his ship was captured by a notorious pirate ship, Nicholas of the Tower. After a quick mock trial, Suffolk was, well, beheaded. I think it has to be the shortest exile ever. His body washed up on the English shore. Oddly, despite being in Ireland, some did try to blame Richard for Suffolk's death. It is possible that he was able to get word that quickly, but it would have been difficult and quite impressive, actually. In an interesting but complicated twist, Suffolk's son, John, was married to Lady Margaret Beaufort a few months before his father's death. Their marriage would be annulled eventually, and she would later marry Edmund Tudor, which I'll get to soon. John, on the other hand, would eventually marry Elizabeth of York, Richard's daughter. Yes, everyone's related. Due to the financial constraints on the kingdom, the commons asked the king to take back many of the grants of land and money that he had given to his various favorites. While Richard wasn't included in this list of favorites and didn't have land to give back, he was still meant to be paid. And this whole problem with a lack of money meant that he wasn't being paid. Edmund Beaufort's time in France wasn't going well. He was insulting the King of France in their correspondence and selling offices in France to the highest bidder instead of appointing those who were qualified. Rouen was lost in October of 1449. By 1450, Edmund had managed to lose most of the English possessions on the continent, at least the northern part. He surrendered Caen, which was Richard's holding on the continent, in July of 1450. If Richard hadn't already had issues with Edmund, this would have sealed their amity. By 1453, all of France, except Calais, would be held by the French. But we're not there yet, and I will tell you about it more. First, we have to get through some riots. It shouldn't surprise anyone that losing wars in the Middle Ages was not popular with the common people. They were often sent off to foreign lands to fight, possibly die. If they returned home, they may have been injured, Or while they were away, they would have been poorly paid. Plus, their jobs weren't being done while they were gone. In England, in the mid-1400s, though, it was made worse by the financial mismanagement of the king and his favorites. In addition, southern parts of England were being attacked by both Norman soldiers and French soldiers. Oh, and there was a rumor that Henry was going to turn parts of Kent into royal forests. I'll explain in a This Too Shall Pass episode soon what a royal forest is, but let's just say that this rumor was seen as a threat to remove people from their land with almost no compensation. By April 1450, this discontent and anger finally exploded in what is now called Jack Cade's Rebellion. It almost feels like a replica of the Peasants' Revolt under Richard II. And that's probably because they share a great deal of similarities. But both uprisings share a great deal with others that occurred over the course of the Hundred Years' War in both England and France. Patrons will hear similarities with the uprisings in France that happened while John II was an English prisoner. Really, 
At the end of the day, the common people only had so many ways to make their voices heard, and protesting could be highly effective, especially if they felt their leaders weren't communicating to the king properly, or the king wasn't listening. Much like the earlier peasants' revolt, this one started in the south of the country, which makes sense when you remember that the attacks from the continent were coming from the channel to the south of the country. A man <laughs> named Jack Cade, which was likely not his real name, who was likely a very lowly commoner, was able to inspire his fellow common members of society. He gave various names for himself, including the title Captain of Kent and John Mortimer. The latter is a fascinating choice, seeing that the Mortimers were a well-known and influential family in England, while the line that married Philippa of Clarence, Lionel of Antwerp's daughter, had ended in the male line. Richard was the senior descendant in the female line through his mother, Anne Mortimer. Remember, Richard was still in Ireland at this time, but using the Mortimer name was enough to implicate him. Kay probably didn't even think of this implication and was instead hoping using a powerful name would help his cause. And remember, Richard was very popular with the commons. They weren't likely to try to mess things up for him. Full disclosure, there is no lack of those named Mortimer in England. Just Roger Mortimer, the first Earl of March, the one who had an affair with Isabella of France, had two further surviving sons in addition to the one I've discussed. It wasn't a rare name. In May 1450, at least 5,000 rebels began to march towards London. They were mostly peasants. By mid-June, they met royal forces, who had the goal of scaring them off. However, the royal forces were woefully unprepared. The peasants were not going to back down easily. Cade even took clothing from the wealthy as the rebels defeated royal forces. Multiple members of the gentry and upper classes were killed before the rebels reached London on the 3rd of July. The rebels, unlike those of the Peasants' Revolt, did loot London extensively. This looting turned the citizens of London, until now willing to welcome this protest, against the rebels. Cade and his followers were effectively kicked out of the city on the 7th, when London Bridge was raised after they left by the locals. On the 8th, they battled with royal forces on London Bridge. The rebels were defeated. Some, including Cade, were convinced to negotiate with the king for pardons. Cade was even granted one, in the name John Mortimer. Since this wasn't his name, and we still don't know what it is, it likely would have been eventually rescinded. But the king decided to proclaim all pardons revoked, because Parliament had not approved of this. Cade died on the 12th of July, and a mock trial of his body was held. It was beheaded, dragged through the streets, and quartered. Oh yes, and he was attained after death. Justice was different then. While this excitement was going on in England, Richard was still in Ireland. He would have gotten news regularly, so he would have known his lands in France were forfeit, and that there was an uprising in England. He probably did worry both about his personal property in England and the governing of the country. He couldn't influence the king from Ireland, and he probably realized the longer he stayed there, the more he'd risk. But those around the king, especially Edmund Beaufort, who had made it back from France at some point before September 11th, were not keen for Richard to return. Unlike Richard II, Henry VI had not gone out and spoken to the rebels. In September of 1450, Richard made his return, though he was almost prevented from landing by men sent on Henry's orders and had to raise soldiers as he traveled. Landing on the 7th, he reached London on the 27th, between his landing and his arrival in London, Edmund was appointed Constable of Calais. Yeah, that had to sting a bit. For many at court, the man who had lost Normandy was being given rewards instead of being told off. This may have had something to do with Henry's goal of attaining peace with France at almost all costs. On his way to the king, Richard, of course, wrote letters. His letters and Henry's responses survive. In his letters, Richard assures the king of his loyalty, and shares his shock that some had tried to prevent his landing. He explained that raising soldiers on his way was for his own protection. Henry expressed to him that he was afraid Richard would be acclaimed king by the populace and overthrow Henry. Henry also admitted to sending patrols against Richard's landing, but the king claimed it was due to this fear. One little thing of interest is that the summons for the next parliament had been sent out on the 3rd of September. 
Had Richard waited even a week before leaving for England, he may have had all the excuse he needed to come. And he yet again emphasized his loyalty to Henry. While Richard was traveling from Wales to London, he contacted his acquaintance, William Tresham, the most recent Speaker of Parliament, to ask for assistance. Getting information from someone who had been in London while he was away would have helped Richard greatly. Tresham left to meet Richard, but on the 23rd of September, he was attacked and killed. This could have been the result of a normal local feud, or it could have been something about who Tresham was meeting. After hearing of Tresham's death, it's easy to see why Richard would have made sure to bring soldiers with him. But it turns out it was probably a good call. Richard forced his way into a meeting with Henry. Richard may have actually slapped the king, though from everything I've read about him, he seems to be a more considered man than to lash out in anger against the one person who could end him. I imagine this is where George R. R. Martin got the idea to have Tyrion slap Joffrey in Game of Thrones. Full disclosure, that may only be in the TV series. I've only read the first book. I promise I'll read the others. Richard had been popular with the common people. Matthew Lewis uses the Paston Letters, a series of letters written by a family of minor landed gentry between 1422 and 1509. I've read through these myself, and they're not just useful, but interesting to read. I'm a huge fan of hearing more from the less powerful, and these are a rare treat in that area. These letters show support from many outside the major nobility for Richard, and hope for him to reform things. The parliament that had been called in September met in early November 1450. The elected speaker for the Commons, William Oldhall, was a supporter of Richard's. Oddly, Richard was not present for the opening. He didn't arrive until the end of November. Not long after his arrival, in early December, Edmund Beaufort and other advisors close to the king were robbed and assaulted. Richard actually rode through the streets of London to warn people not to attack the king's counselors, and that justice would be swift for those who did. While Richard was calling for the assaults to stop, he was still in favor of removing Edmund Beaufort from Henry's side. There is some confusion over what happened next. Edmund Beaufort may have been placed in the tower, likely for his protection, but it was a rather unsure time. The general feeling I get from the year 1450 in England is chaos. The year started with the king's closest advisor banished and executed, and ended with his closest family member and his counselors being assaulted and robbed. With the commons asking for those advisors who allowed France to fall to be imprisoned or banished, and a king who couldn't make up his mind trying to manage all of this. Henry's answer to these requests was, well, much as would be expected from a man who couldn't make decisions and didn't want to upset anyone. He said that he would banish those on the list that the commons had presented to him, unless they were those who regularly waited on him. So this pretty much protected all of those who the commons was asking to be banished. Richard wasn't leading the commons to make these requests, but the commons did support him. He hadn't been involved in the loss of France, and his performance in Ireland had been exemplary. Despite all the accusations that would come later, at this moment, Richard, in every way publicly and in all ways that can be found privately, was loyal to Henry. He wanted the poor advisors removed from his cousin's side. He wanted Beaufort punished for the losses in France. And he wanted to have the king listen to his counsel, which, based on everything Richard had done, would have been pretty good. Richard was supported by many during this time and could have easily made a move, but didn't. Rather, he used his popularity to speak out for the king. He used his popularity to bolster the king. He asked the common people to stop rising up against the king's council, while asking the king to properly punish those who had caused English losses. Despite all that Richard was doing for him, Henry still chose to keep Beaufort close. As you may have noticed, England was suffering from money troubles. Severe money troubles. To try to balance the kingdom's books, which were deeply in the red, Parliament passed the Act of Resumption in May of 1451, which would take back the grants given by the king. There were many grants that were exempt, to keep too many from being angered by this act. But Parliament wasn't done making demands. A petition requested that Gloucester be posthumously rehabilitated and pardoned. And finally, a motion that was not recorded in the rolls, but was recorded in Bennett's Chronicle, 
This requested that Richard be officially declared the king's heir until Henry had a son of his own. Apparently the man who requested this, Thomas Young, was arrested and held in the tower. After Parliament closed, Richard returned to his Welsh estates. He was reconfirmed in some offices he held, which would have assured him that he was still in royal favour, if not a favourite. While there was ongoing fighting amongst various nobles in England throughout 1451, Richard continued to support the king. While Richard had been supportive of the king, Edmund Beaufort had apparently continued to spread rumours slandering Richard. Richard wrote to the king to protest his innocence. In February of 1452, this came to a head when Richard wrote to the locals of Shrewsbury to accuse Beaufort of treason. He requested assistance to stand up against Beaufort, but made sure to continue to support the king. With these supporters, who were a small army, Richard marched towards London. Henry was quickly moved north to the Midlands. When Richard reached London, the gates were closed to him. Henry wanted to know what Richard's intentions were and sent an embassy to discover what was going on. Included in this embassy were Richard's brother-in-law, Salisbury, and Salisbury's son, Warwick, along with the bishops of Winchester and Ely, plus a random smattering of other nobles. Richard demanded the arrest of Beaufort and that he be removed from Henry's side. When Henry received word, he had a response sent to Richard that it was done. Richard disbanded his supporters and went to his king. When he arrived, he was met by the king and Beaufort. Yeah, Henry had either lied or been talked out of arresting Beaufort by either Beaufort himself or Margaret of Anjou, who was close to Beaufort. This points towards a man not looking to take a throne, but to support the king. Richard was arrested upon his arrival on the 1st of March. Ten days later, he rode into London in front of the king. He was forced to swear loyalty publicly at St. Paul's. Richard was forbidden from raising an army again without the king's permission. His only means of settling issues without breaking his oath was to sue the king for assistance. There was a report written in the Grafton Chronicle, remember, written much later than these events, that Richard's oldest surviving son, Edward, the future Edward IV, rode for London with an army to demand his father's release. There are a few issues with this story. Edward wasn't even 10, which, even for the brilliant military leader he would become, was a bit of a stretch. Cecily, Richard's wife and Edward's mother, could have set things up and used her son as a figurehead, but that is a bit of a stretch. This may have been just a rumour, and it was enough to see Richard's release. He returned to Ludlow. Richard may have been granted a general pardon in mid-1452. He did apply for one. 1452 also saw Henry realise that he needed to support his remaining holdings in France or risk losing them. The nobles of Gascony asked for the king's support, and he ordered John Talbot, who had been in Calais, to march on Bordeaux, successfully putting the city back into English hands. The year ended much better than it had started. In early January 1453, someone got Margaret of Anjou pregnant. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We all know I don't like it when women are besmirched with malicious rumors. Margaret and Henry finally conceived a child. I can't find when the pregnancy was announced, but it's likely at some point around spring of 1453, probably after Margaret's visit to Our Lady of Walsingham, a shrine she would have visited to pray for help in conceiving. Parliament had been called on the 20th of January that year and assembled in early March. Richard was rightly called. Henry seemed reinvigorated, possibly from the win in Gascony and possibly from knowing that his wife was finally pregnant. The king awarded Beaufort for his loyal but less than impressive service by giving his dukedom, Somerset, precedence over all non-royal dukedoms. Imagine if someone did that today. Norfolk would explode. Since there were no royal dukes at this moment, this placed Beaufort first among the secular nobility. In much kinder news, Henry also elevated two new earls. Edmund and Jasper Tudor were elevated to the earldoms of Richmond and Pembroke, respectively. Edmund and Jasper were Henry's maternal half-brothers. His mother, Catherine of Valois, married Owen Tudor, their father, in secret after the death of Henry V. I'm sorry if you can hear Ziggy. There is one further rumor related to Beaufort and these two young men. It is that he was the father of one or both. 
He and Catherine of Valois had been accused of having an affair, and her first child, by her second husband, was obviously named Edmund. Most biographers think Owen was the father to both his claimed sons. These brothers would have been a boon for Henry. Two people who were family, but of no threat, at least to his throne in England. They could theoretically have challenged for France as children of a French princess, but that would have been just a bit of a stretch. When Parliament assembled, Richard was probably thrown off a bit when William Oldhall, a supporter of his and a former speaker in Parliament, was accused of treason for supposedly supporting Jack Cade. Oldhall took sanctuary in St. Martin's le Grand. He was eventually kept in the custody of the king's valet. Parliament also heard a request that Cade, who had been dead for more than two years, be attained for a second time. Yes, as I mentioned, he had been attained once already, but they really wanted to be sure that none of his heirs could inherit anything. These moves may have been made to reduce Richard's influence and power in court. He was also removed as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, which is pretty insulting, especially when added to the suggestions of treason. Remember, he was slightly implicated with Kate. Cecily Neville even wrote to Queen Margaret asking that her husband's honor be restored. She may not have known that Margaret was not ever going to be on Richard's side at this point. Parliament was put on hold in early July, with a planned return in mid-November. So far, 1453 wasn't too bad for England, but it was about to start getting much worse. The Percy-Neville feud was growing. The dominant Neville faction in this case was the younger group, those for whom Joan Beaufort was their mother. In addition to this building disagreement, which will come into open fighting soon, there was another internal conflict. This one also involved the Nevilles, though this is the next generation. Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, yes, that one, and Edmund Beaufort did not get along. This should be surprising, since Warwick's father, Salisbury, was Beaufort's cousin, All of these arguments were about land. Each side of both argument had rival claims on various holdings. Really, it was a lot of rich men who these days would have just sued each other instead of raising arms. Also, these days letters, Peyton, granting land are much more specific. Henry progressed west during the break in Parliament to attempt to settle the Warwick-Beaufort dispute. He did have the option of going north to settle the Percy-Neville dispute. For the Warwick-Beaufort dispute, he sided with his favorite, and may have guaranteed that Warwick would never support Henry. With everything that happens next, maybe he should have chosen to go north. At the same time, Charles VII decided this was the moment to attack Gascony. Talbot had been holding things together in the south of France, but he was no match for French guns. Yes, literal guns. On the 17th of July, 1453, Talbot was killed and English control over Gascony ended. This left England with only Calais. And because it's so anticlimactic, I almost forgot to mention it. This was the last battle of the Hundred Years' War. The war would officially end, well, 20 years later, but the fall of Bordeaux on the 19th of October, 1453, was the end. The Burgundians would try to restart this, but Edward IV declined, after a bribe from the French king, which was probably good for everyone in the long run. No one knows if Henry received this news, but in August, his reign would change forever. This is when he experienced his first mental break. Unlike his maternal grandfather, Charles VI of France, his illness didn't start out with a violent attack. Instead, this king was in a catatonic state. He couldn't or wouldn't respond to those around him. With Henry ill, there was a possibility that Richard could rise in power, which would threaten Beaufort. It also appears that Queen Margaret felt threatened by this idea due to the friendship she had formed with Beaufort. While Parliament was a thing, this was still a time when the king had near-absolute control. There was also something important that the king would be needed for. On the 13th of October, 1453, Henry's only child was born. He was named Edward, after the king's favorite saint, whose feast day he happened to be born on. The king was needed to claim the child, while it's assumed that the child born in a marriage was the husband's, it was still important for the father to acknowledge his birth. 
Henry could barely be made to eat. There was no way for him to acknowledge his son. Thankfully, at least at the time, no one questioned the queen. But they would be waiting for more than a year before their king could welcome his son. This may be where the future malicious gossip about Edward's parentage comes from. Richard was called back to court in November of 1453 to help run the kingdom while the king was ill. Parliament could not be reopened without the king. It was delayed until February of 1454. Not long after Richard's arrival in London, he had Beaufort arrested and sent to the tower. This might have been a little underhanded. Beaufort was charged with treason. In January of 1454, Queen Margaret pressed her own claim to regency while her husband was ill. In her defense, in France, this wouldn't be uncommon. Some of the most famous French queens were regents for their sons, husbands, or brothers. Women couldn't be queen regnant there, but they could still rule. In England, though, things were a bit different. The first chance for a queen regent since the conquest was Henry III, who was a child king. But his mother, Isabella of Angoulême, was completely unsuitable for the role. After that, the next was Edward III, when his mother overthrew his father. Since her regency went so poorly, this wasn't something the English seemed to want to repeat. Even Henry VI didn't have his mother as his regent. It didn't help that Margaret of Anjou was French. <laughs> it might have also hurt her that she only had one child. Had there been a nursery full of royal children, she may have had a better chance. Instead, Richard was given power. In mid-February, to make sure the country could still run, Richard was given the power to open and close Parliament. He could also give royal assent in the king's name specifically to acts in Parliament. The other leaders in England likely hoped the king would recover quickly, so they could have his guidance. But that was not to be. The biggest problems that needed the king's approval was the appointment of a new Archbishop of Canterbury and a new Lord Chancellor. Richard would not make these appointments on his own. Yes, he was leading things, but he had to be convinced each step of the way. To further minimize undue influence on the king, he sent a group of nobles, three bishops, three earls, two viscounts, three lords, and a prior, just to be safe, to ascertain what the king could or could not agree to. The questions they were to present to the king were recorded in the parliamentary roll. The delegation visited Henry on the 23rd of March, without York to again avoid undue influence. As you may all know, the king could not be made to respond to the questions. With the king's continuing infirmary, Parliament decided to appoint a protector, much like was done during the king's minority. Richard, rightly by cultural practice, protested that he wasn't worthy of the appointment when he was named. Beaufort likely wasn't considered, and seeing that Parliament had allowed him to be imprisoned, this isn't surprising. Richard wanted to protect himself from claims of usurpation. He also wanted clear instructions as to what his authority was, and he needed to be paid. The last point is understandable if you remember how bad payments had been for both his time in France and Ireland. Richard was declared Lord Protector and Defender of the Realm and the Church on the 27th of March, 1454. This passed Parliament on the 3rd of April. The King, Queen, and their son were sent to Windsor. I assume for their pleasure and security. While he wasn't officially appointed until the 3rd of April, Richard called council on the 30th of March. He appointed Salisbury, his brother-in-law, as chancellor because the country needed one to function. Richard's appointment is fascinating in one major way. It didn't include any mention of the king's recovery. The council who appointed Richard seemed to think that Henry would never recover. It did include language that Richard would remain Lord Protector until Edward, Henry's infant son, came of age. Edward would then be offered the option to allow Richard to continue as Protector or to take over the role himself. Richard also made sure that Edward was invested as Prince of Wales, which further indicated that he thought Edward was Henry's son, even if gossip mongers of the day didn't. Richard made sure that council met regularly and led by consensus, without being as easily led as Henry had been. Oh, and he kept Beaufort in prison, which shouldn't surprise anyone, but Richard didn't press ahead with charges of treason. He even called those who he knew were not on friendly terms to deal with the defense of Calais and England. 
These included the enemy of his brother-in-law and chancellor, Henry Percy, the second Earl of Northumberland. To emphasize, not the treasonous Henry Percy's that you may remember from earlier episodes, who were his father and grandfather. He called the Duke of Buckingham, Humphrey Stafford, who had supported Beaufort, though oddly a brother-in-law of Salisbury. Everyone is related. Richard also included the king's half-brothers, Edmund and Jasper, who would have only owed loyalty to their brother. Oddly enough, the three of them worked very well together. It truly was an inclusive council, though Margaret and Beaufort probably wouldn't agree. The Percy Neville feud erupted in full in 1545. Their property dispute, come personal war, led to a minor war of words in Parliament, and coaxed Richard into writing a letter to his son-in-law, Henry Holland, Duke of Exeter, who, along with Thomas Percy, Lord Irgermont, the son of Henry Percy, had been stirring up rebellion in Yorkshire. These letters stated that he wanted his son-in-law to stop his acts of rebellion and that his behavior wasn't fitting his station. With this letter, he sent others to those involved that they needed to stop their uprising, and then Richard headed north to take care of things in person. He spent almost a fortnight sorting out these issues and putting the riots to rest for the moment. His son-in-law fled to London, where Richard had him arrested by northern justices that he had sent south. Holland was held until Richard returned. Council committed Holland to prison on the 24th of July. They were a bit cheeky in the prison they chose to place him in, Pontefract. This is the prison that Richard II died in, and as you may remember, Holland was a nephew of Richard II's. That's, um, that's one way to let your son-in-law know he won't be welcome at Christmas dinner this year. I'll remind you all that Richard's choices throughout this period were not unilateral. He involved council in everything he did. Richard would have himself appointed captain of Calais not long after he sorted out the north. I think Richard was either truly honestly loyal at this point or the most manipulative person. <laughs> Richard had avoided calling for the prosecution of Beaufort for a long time. By mid-July, though, others on the council were asking what should be done with him. Richard stated again that he thought Beaufort had committed treason and didn't want him released on any type of bail. Richard does state that he wants the great legal minds of the kingdom to examine the case and that he wants the peers of the realm to have input on making charges against Beaufort. On the 28th of July, he agreed that a trial for Beaufort would be held by the 28th of October, 1454. This didn't happen, and I can't find out the exact reason, but Beaufort wasn't presented to counsel at any point in 1454. Instead, in mid-November, Richard sorted out Henry's household as part of the economic reforms that had been called for in the years preceding and following Jack Cade's rebellion. This reform, though, upset one person in particular. Queen Margaret's household was reduced, and she had to share it with her son. Her household, by the way, was made up of 120 individuals after the reduction, so it wasn't like she wouldn't have help. But she felt it was a slight on her queenly dignity. Henry's household was between 385 and 398, depending on the time of year. Let's not weep too much for them and their reduced households. It's important to note that there's no evidence that Richard was doing anything, at this point at least, in a malicious way to make Margaret of Anjou's life difficult or to displace her from the king's side. He even made sure her son, whom Henry couldn't even acknowledge, let alone claim, was given his due rights. Richard seemed to be stabilizing the kingdom in many ways, getting the country's finances under control, and dealing with the fighting within the nobility. But all good things come to an end, right? One of the best quotes I've found to describe this is from Robin Story, the historian and writer of the book The End of the House of Lancaster. Spoilers. Quote, If Henry's insanity was a tragedy, his recovery was a national disaster. End quote. And this disaster started unfolding at Christmas 1454. On Christmas Day, he was finally able to acknowledge his son. It was as though Henry had been woken from a long nap. He was apparently overjoyed to learn that the boy had been named Edward, since this was, of course, his favorite saint. Henry was well enough to return to Parliament in February 1455. On the 9th, he entered Richard's control. Well, Richard actually resigned 
Whether the king really encouraged him to do so is up for debate. Prior to his illness, Henry had been focused mainly on his prayers and his aims of peace, plus his building of King's College. But after his recovery, something had changed. His behaviors over the next few years will show this. Henry released Beaufort from the tower in early March and declared Beaufort innocent and declared him a true and loyal subject. With Henry's recovery, Richard and his supporters were stripped of their appointments. This isn't completely surprising. This included Richard's appointment to Calais and Salisbury's role as Lord Chancellor. Henry appointed a new Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Boucher, who was granted the Great Seal and the role of Lord Chancellor. This was a normal set of circumstances. Richard and his Neville in-laws returned to the north after the king removed them from his inner circle. While Richard and the Nevilles may have been out of fashion with the nobility, they were very popular with the common people. Beaufort, on the other hand, had almost no support with the common people, especially those in London. Beaufort's support from the nobility likely came from his uncanny ability to stay in Henry's good graces. With Henry back in power, Richard and his Neville supporters needed to be careful with their next move. Henry called for a great council to meet on the 21st of May, 1455, in Leicester. If you remember all the way back to John of Gaunt's episodes, Leicester was part of his Lancastrian inheritance from his first wife, Blanche of Lancaster. It was in the heart of the area that would support the king in Beaufort, and was a risky area for Richard, as he would have little support. Henry and his council had planned to meet in Leicester, but they hadn't started moving that way as of the 18th of May. We know this because this is when the king found out that Richard, Salisbury, and Warwick, along with between 3,000 and 7,000 men, were marching south. Beaufort ordered the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Boucher, to send a letter commanding them to disband. On the 20th of May, Richard wrote a letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury, insisting on his loyalty to the king. Richard and the Yorkist would not disband. Beaufort ordered his supporters to St. Albans, north of London, and he and Henry began to travel to the location. Richard and his men changed direction to meet them there. Richard was sending Henry letters during this time throughout the marches, two of them, declaring his loyalty, but he wasn't receiving any responses. It appears that Henry was not receiving Richard's letters. There's no record as to why, but blaming Beaufort wouldn't be the worst suggestion. Remember, Henry had once agreed to arrest Beaufort, but was convinced by Queen Margaret not to, and this time Margaret was nowhere near the king. Henry and Beaufort had more of the nobility on their side. As Matthew Lewis puts it, quote, they had grown rich on Henry's ineptitude, end quote, and people who are wealthy in this way often don't want change. Richard, though, was also in the wrong. He had promised three years earlier to submit himself to the king's justice alone. So, two sides were getting close to facing off, and there's only one way for this to end. Yes, we are headed to a battle, and I don't do battles. I want to make it incredibly clear here. When a battle against a king happens, and it's made by one of his subjects, that is treason. <laughs> so, in no uncertain terms, Richard is about to commit treason. He has his reasons, but I don't want to give him an excuse for it. I may not do battles, but Philip, my husband, likes taking a look at them. And I had him take a look at these battle lines with no knowledge of who was fighting. He did know the time period. He quickly surmised who won. And it was Richard. And this was the first battle of St. Albans. This is the start of the Wars of the Roses. I will note quickly that this is the battle where Warwick started showing the military prowess that would make him the kingmaker in less than a decade. After the battle was over, a few weeks later, Warwick would in fact receive the captainship of Calais, since Beaufort wouldn't be able to manage it. You'll find out in two seconds. Not only did Richard win, but his greatest opponent, Beaufort, was killed. See, I told you. Henry Percy, not the treacherous one, was also killed. The king was taken hostage, also with the Duke of Buckingham, who, remember, was Salisbury's brother-in-law. I will point out very quickly that Richard did have a chance to kill the king if he had wanted to, but Henry survived the battle and the aftermath. Richard even swore his loyalty to the king again after the battle, in person, on his knees, in front of the king. Even though Richard had committed treason, and this is the start of the Wars of the Roses, 
he isn't claiming the English throne, at least not publicly. He was still claiming that he wanted the king to listen to his council and to focus on reforms of the kingdom's finances. Remember, Richard had temporarily controlled the kingdom well. He had performed well in France and Ireland, yet his council was ignored in favor of Beaufort, who had shown poor counsel and had performed poorly in France and appeared only focused on his own betterment. After the battle, Richard took the king back to London after disbanding his men. Richard saw to it that the king was crowned again at St. Paul's Cathedral. While Richard had won the battle, the war wasn't anywhere near being over. Both Beaufort and Percy had heirs, unhelpfully both named Henry, who would take up their father's cause, with a bit more political awareness at first. Oh, and Richard's son-in-law managed to escape with Henry Percy's younger son, so Richard had that to look out for. With that warning, it's time to take a break until next week. Since this was a huge episode, I'll keep this bit short, and I'll see you all then. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.